Hello everyone, this is Javiera for 1133podcast.com and today I am once more and as always a privilege with Amara Samata. Amara is an emerging master and spiritual teacher, a healer and the founder of the Inner Guidance Institute. Today we're going to be discussing a really interesting topic which is what happens after we die, or what happens after death. So, after a profound awakening of consciousness, Amara experienced within herself the different realms after death, and she can talk about what happens after we die, and the many possibilities that we can encounter. So Amara, thank you so much for being here. It's always an honor and a privilege to share space with you and to discuss such big topics. So welcome <laughs> to this interview once more. Thank you, Javi. Uh, so happy to be here again and uh, speaking with you. Um, okay, well, okay, so that's a deep end uh, subject. <laughs> um a lot of what happens when we die is, it, well, if not all of it, is extremely dependent on what happens when we live. Mm. So, um, yeah, to address what happens or what could happen or what might happen when we die, we have to really be looking a lot at, you know, what does that say about how we live? Or how we did live, you know, and I'm really interested in um, what I call, a, you know, really closing the gap on the on the sort of loop of cyclical experience. So, in order to live consciously, um, we're finding a, you know, I mean, this has been this has been around. This, you know, this idea is not new. It's been around for a long time, but we're really seeing. That we need to die consciously, um, go into the what, whatever would happen happen after death consciously, um, reincarnate consciously, uh, give birth consciously, raise our children consciously, <laughs> you know, become adults ourselves consciously, uh, and then when that time comes, you know, to pass away or to pass over in the most conscious way possible. And the more conscious we are in life, obviously, the more conscious we're going to be in death. And when we can bring consciousness to the birthing process as well for ourselves um, and also the being that's coming through, you know, it's just imagine the most amazing experience of being completely aware and really empowered in that whole process, you know, from beginning to end to beginning again. Um, from childhood to adulthood, you know, to older age, um, death and dying, uh, rebirthing and back around again, um, or not, or what, however you want to, whatever you want to have happen within <laughs> that cycle, or whatever you would like to imagine to be the most, you know, empowered or blissful or peaceful or amazing experience. Imagine being able to have that as a reality. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in um, looking at all cycles within, especially within a spiritual context. So many of us, you know, we, we sort of get the idea that, oh, I want to become interested in my spiritual growth. And, um, and then it comes towards the end of our lives and we sort of hope for the best and then it starts all over again. Mm. And um, depending on the level of consciousness that you have in life and how far you're willing to commit and take that and, you know, stay true to that, there does come a point where, mm, and this, yeah, this is okay, wait, this is a really big expression, but there comes a point where you don't fall back again into unconscious existing. Um, this can, this is debated too, and, and that's when we get into talking about the quantum field that we live in. But first of all, let's <laughs> let's, let's say that um, let's back up a little bit. Yeah, let's back up into 
conscious living, what happens dying consciously, getting through that, what are the benefits of that, and um, yeah, how to make it something that doesn't slip out of your hands, you know, so right. that we're never starting all over again from scratch, but it can certainly feel that way. <laughs> so wait a second. Most of us don't really know what happens after death. And so I'm really curious to know, and I'm sure most of the listeners here are wondering what happens after we die. And also I want to ask you, how is it that you, you know, can have a, a, a saying on this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So if you Good. can share a little bit of your journey as well. Yes. Okay, so I'm speaking from um, from direct experience that I've had in terms of shifts in perception and experiences or an experiential um, understanding that I've come uh, to know somewhat through my teachings, uh, through the through the teachings, but mostly through my own inner experience that I've had within the inner dance or what I offer is the inner guidance process. And being able to take myself um, really deep into myself and to see beyond the basic realms of, of self. Okay, so all of this is, you know, deeply experiential from my point of view. And it um, you can take it as... Maybe it will confirm something that somebody's listening to that, that they understand, or maybe it will challenge something that they understand. And they're welcome, you know, all the listeners are welcome to take this ho however is best for their own system. You know, it can be, you can consider it a theory, you can consider it an idea, you can say, oh, that makes so much sense, you can say, I'm not so sure about that. You know, it's really important that anytime you hear something that's especially going to um, possibly challenge, you know, beliefs that you've been told your whole life, um, that you're going to, you know, your first reaction might be that to have a reaction, and then it's good to what I call react, reflect, respond. So whatever reaction you have, um, awesome, take that, reflect on why, why you had that reaction, uh, and then really look at what might be your new response to that, and whatever it is is going to be perfect. For you. So that's just what I'm going to qualify because whenever we start talking about big things in life, you know, people get um, triggered positive, negative, or sometimes they're just neutral in, in that ex experience of hearing that. So, um, yeah, just take care of your of yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a big warning right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my disclaimer right there. <laughs> Don't at, come after me. It's, you know, it's just my experience. Um we may have total, total different ideas, and that's fine, too. Mm. Okay, so mm, a lot okay, of what happens after death is what happens in life. So the same work that you do, if we're going to call it work, it's not really work, but the evolution that takes place, um, let's say that you're having a spiritual evolution and unfolding, we, we tend to experience it, experience it as an expanding or contracting, um, I call it the expanding of love and the contracting of fear. But whatever spiritual journey you're on, or it might just be a life journey, you know, um, we don't have to call it spiritual. Um, but however you're evolving in life, it's the same work, whether you're just starting out, it's the first time you've ever decided to look at yourself in a deep way, or whether you're, uh, you know, an awakened, embodied Zen master, you know, it's the same work. You're always, it just becomes more and more and more subtle. Um, it becomes very, um, yeah, things that were really big and obvious become more and more and more subtle as you work on them, you know? These, your little, um, not sure what the word would be, like, you know, whatever whatever it is that kind of trips you up and takes you out of truth. Illusion? Yeah, so whatever, however illusion is being expressed through you and however realization is coming through you, it, it doesn't stop at death. 
Right. <laughs> so here comes, you know, you have your evolution, right? You have what you know and what you don't know, uh, what you believe, what you've given up on believing. And um, as death comes, um, well, it's a big day, we could say. You know, <laughs> when death comes, that's a pretty big day, right? <laughs> It's it's not such a casual moment. This is where everything kind of comes to a head, you know, because you're really faced with the unknown. And we're not really trained to, you know, go running headfirst into the unknown. We're, we're, we're designed, well, we're conditioned. I'm going to use that word. We're conditioned to avoid the unknown. We're conditioned to employ control. You know, we don't like being out of control. We like knowing how things are. The egoic construct is very much in its sense of survival and safety. Um, We'll look for control. When you meet death, um, for the most part, that pretty much goes out the window. (laughs) There's not a lot of control you have. (laughs) It's the ultimate uh, surrender for well, not for consciousness, but, you know, embodied consciousness, to go to unembodied consciousness, that's that's a pretty big day. Um, so we're basically just leaving the body. You're leaving? Yeah. So that consciousness that you, that has um, expanded, it, it's it's grown within you, it's, it's identified itself as you, you know, the body part um, falls away. And if you look at the, you know, the classic near-death experience um, that that people have, they will all say that they're really surprised at the moment where they suddenly look down at their body or they step away and they see that their body is there and they still feel like themselves just without a body. Mm. So personality, you know, all of that, they're they're always shocked that it can exist outside of a body. Um, But many have described feeling as if this were absolutely true, you know. Um... Now, I can't begin to go into all the different things that could possibly happen at death. Um, from, you know, the Buddhist tradition and um, even somewhat from the Christian mysticism, um, the Gnostic tradition, and mostly, you know, from my own experience. Well, there's... Um, the same things that happen in death is what happens a lot within awakening. Because a perception, a huge shift is going to happen. As soon as your body falls away, yeah, it, that, and you're still there, there's a real indication that you are not what you thought you were. Hmm. So, you know... A good 80, 90 percent of your belief systems are going to go out the window at that moment uh, because, you know, it's, it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> um, energy doesn't just dissolve, it transforms, but it doesn't, it never disappears. It's never not. If you look at just the science of energy, it doesn't become nothing, it becomes, it, it transforms into something. So that conscious energy is going to have a transformation. Now, the amount of consciousness um, that you have at death, and, and I am a big advocate of dying consciously. And, you know, there's traditions where you try to die sitting up or you try to die, you know, in a, in a way where you maintain that level of consciousness. And that's why it's really um, beneficial to have a natural death, just like having a natural birth. There's something really beautiful and authentic and integrated in the consciousness when you're not um, having intervention with drugs and you know other things that can kind of dull the mind and dull mm-hmm. the system. There's a loss that happens within that. But that said, as soon as you step out and you're no longer in a body that's having those things put in it, yes. uh, you return, you are what you you are what you are. That can't completely diminish the experience of consciousness. 
mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And um, but there's okay, there's all kinds of levels of experience that can happen. Just, just it's really an infinite possibility. There's so many infinite things that can happen after death. But there are hallmarks or there are markers, experiences that tend to be something you might bump into. And Mm -hmm. so this is for people who are interested in just kind of, I'm just going to be super basic because really all kinds of things can happen. These are just kind of the big basic chunks of things that it might be beneficial for you to know about. Um, I will listen to that and then I'll ask you a couple of questions about that. Yeah. Mm. So there's always going to be a meeting of fear. It comes up. Uh, Fear and love are the two things that are going to be encountered. And um, we call this, um, I call this the dragon and the peacock. Same thing that happens during awakening. Um, And awakening out of identity is an awakening out of fear and into love in a very significant way. That brings about a divine perspective. And you can experience that when you're alive, Yeah, you right? can experience that when you're alive. Now, there's a great opportunity to wake up at death because a huge amount, as I said, of your identity is going to fall away because we're so identified with our bodies. Right. So body falls away, you're still there. You know, what do we all say? Oh, my gosh. You know, oh, my God. Am, am I dead? You know, dead people will all will ask themselves, am I dead? What's happening? You know, what is this? You, you, you'll suddenly realize you can question. Mm. You can make inquiry. You know, you can, you can still wonder. You can still ask. So a lot of just really basic what comes up um, can be fear. Some people experience darkness, you know, what feels like an eternal darkness. You can experience, um, um, yeah, everything that could come from a shadow aspect of self, from just sitting in a kind of eternal, lonely, intense loneliness can arise. Um, abandonment can arise. Um, fear uh, arises, and there are even, you know, visualizations, experiences that seem extremely real, uh, real that have to do with, you know, demons and, you know demonic beings and things coming to scare you into it's really like um you know what i talk about the traps and the opportunities of living there's the traps and opportunities of dying so one of the traps of dying just as in life is falling into fear so um really addressing your fears before you you die is really key to having a beautiful transition into the other side. And, you know, I mean, it's, you can be thrown right onto a roller coaster that maybe you're not ready for, and that can be really scary, you know, to be met with things or, or to see things and offer things. So there's a lot of fear. So we'll just say there's the, um, the trap of fear that arises. And in this trap of fear, there's an opportunity to call on love, Mm -hmm. yeah, to transform that into love. So this is where people will call on angels, they will call on their, um, their version of God, or, you know, they will call on whatever it is that, um, that comes to them, whatever their version of God, you know, even if they didn't have one at all before, some things in you will call towards that you know, which is bigger than yourself in that moment. And then, again, this can come forward. And then once that has been called on in a very, very sincere way, um, this is where we can have the experience of um, the more angelic experience or, or light coming or God coming or angels coming. And And I'm not here to say that, you know, that the the shadow aspect of fear and all that that brings up, and the light aspect of love and all that that brings up. I'm not saying that it's real or unreal. Um, It certainly is going to feel real. (laughs) Mm -hmm. In my experience, just as in life, 
It's not as real as we tend to think it is. You know, there's a lot of reality that is being believed as real that is really just a perpetuated story that's not as true as we'd like to think. Same thing on the other side. Same thing as we're transitioning. So one of the beautiful things that you can do is to um, interact as lovingly, as courageously as you can with the fear, and then interacting um, with, with the light side that comes in. So as you're going through duality, yeah, you have the shadow aspect and the light. We, call it, we could call it good and evil. And um, to whatever relationship you have with the duality is the relationship that you're going to experience after, after death. So if you have a very hyper-polarized expression of duality and you really have a strong relationship with good and bad, which means that in life there are things that you, um, say, are craving or addicted to or really longing for, and then there's things that you hate and you just want to get away from mm-hmm. and you have a strong aversion to, that's going to be your experience on the other side. If you have a more neutral aspect of good and bad and you and you have a more or even an enlightened aspect of seeing the oneness of all that is, those things are going to be more um, less polarized, you know, uh, less of a, yeah, less of a challenge. Uh, but everyone still feels it because we have what's unconscious within us and it really gets into that. It will find it. It will seek it out. You know, it's almost like if you take, I have not taken it, but if you've taken, I've heard about, you know, ayahuasca or some of these things, which I don't recommend. That's a whole nother topic. But there are people who, you know, can take a some type of a, you know, shamanic drug experience and it will go deep into your psyche, right? And start pulling out fears that you didn't even recognize that you had. And you can go through all kinds of uh, things in those trips. So I don't know if it's relevant, but that might be something that it's been compared to, you know, in that. Um, when you, okay, so then the next thing after fear, if you pass the test of fear, and now this is really interesting, in the, at least in, the, um, in many of the Buddhist traditions, they say that when fear arises um, and darkness comes in, you know, or demons come in and... Uh, that the the what becomes the hungry ghost is those that actually run away in fear, and then they end up in other dimensions, sort of hanging mm. out for a while until they can come to terms with that. And they go into the fear. light. Yeah. So the light is always within you. Yeah. And when you tap into the light that is within you, uh, that light will reflect itself out of you, and that they will come together. So you can call on the light at any time. Anyone in any realm, in any dimension, can call on the light at any time. Yeah. So the hungry ghost can call, can suddenly realize, uh, I'm not lost. There is a light within me, and um, I can call on it. And that's the minute of their transformation. If we're going to say that experience is real, that's that's one thing that has been um, understood. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I've, I've seen how that happens. Um, so for what I'm understanding, when fear arises, mm-hmm. is that we can either call for something superior, right, of our version of God, mm-hmm. or we can also recognize the light that we have within. Or we can do both. Maybe. Yes, yeah. It, one will illuminate the other. They will both illuminate each other. And you will realize, when you call on the light, you will realize the light that you are. Um, to some degree. <laughs> depending a lot on your belief system. If you really believe that there is a light greater than you and that you are not that, and you must simply humble yourself to that light, mm-hmm. sure, you could have that relationship uh, yes. to, to the light. Um, so as you're going out of fear, and if you are holding fast or you are... One of my favorite phrases for people who are passing, I tell them, um, if they are spoken to on the other side and if they're in fear, um, is to remember that you're already free. So I'm already free. Thank you very much, fear. It's just an opportunity to have an experience in which you're going to learn about love in a really challenging way. (laughs) (laughs) That's the beauty of fear, you know. Um, Fear is really a test of faith. 
And it's a great opportunity to have your faith in whatever it is your highest belief is tested. Uh, so it's very useful to actually be um, in gratitude to whatever arises in the fearful states and to tell it, uh, thank you so much, um, but I don't need you anymore. <laughs> uh, and I choose faith, and I call on that. I call on that now. And please, you have every right, you know, to call on it, to come to you, to demand it to come. You know, I need you, whatever that is. You know, come be with me, save me, um, come to me, love me, you know, mm -hmm. Ca calling on the love that you are. And, um, and some, again, will feel it from the outside coming in, and some will feel it from the inside going out. And some feel it all around them, and, you know, there's many possibilities. Um, but it's, it's what you are. Uh, yeah, and then there's many theories about what happens if you fall into that fear. Then you do spend a time in an experience of fear. Um, who knows? You could be, there's all kinds of things that could happen with that. Dimensions of fear. There's experiences that corroborate that fear and make it real for you. Um, and it has a lot to do with what I've seen, which happens with the life review. It also depends, your life review depends a lot on your belief system as well. So, and it doesn't exactly have to happen. There's a little, you know, talk about where the life review happens, if it's instantly right at first, if it happens a little bit after you've gone through the tests of fear. And then on the other side is the test of um, what I call the peacock. So the peacock offers you... Um, Okay, this is a really, this, this seems to be quite universal that mm -hmm. comes up as we're transitioning out. Um, there are, uh, actually, okay, life review comes up in here. We're going to say fear, life review, and, and the other offerings. Yeah, they're all kind of in this same area. So just to be clear, kind of what I call the peacock are the temptations, you know, so... Just like when Buddha had his awakening or Christ had his awakening, there were the, you know, the fears that came up, I think, in the, in the times of, what, 40 days in the desert or mm -hmm. something, you know, and then there were the temptations that right. came. And, you know, they held fast. I'm already free. I don't need these things. I'm, you know, I'm going to stay. I'm moving towards the unknown. Deeper surrender. See what comes out of that. So there is a, a great surge of um, sexual energy that comes at you, and it starts to offer you things. Are we talking about the judgment stage here? This is happening. It could be before or after. You know, I'm not exactly sure, but you're going to encounter this for sure within within your experience as you're passing through, unless you're going to bypass this. But this is the typical, typical thing that happens, is you have a surge of sexual energy, and there are offerings that come to you in the form of um, for your next life, Yes. So I'll back up to the life review. So that's for fame, for beauty, for wealth. This is usually what you get offered. Okay. Does it make sense? So we get offered that to come back into life? Kind yeah. Of thing? Yeah. So this is an offering uh, to come back. Now mm -hmm. you have your life review. And, and the life review is described as that moment where your entire life sort of flashes before your eyes, and mm -hmm. in an instant you see everything um, that you did to everyone, everything what they did to you, and you get to see all the, again, depending on your level of consciousness, you get to see deep into the field, how they were feeling, how you were feeling, what was really happening, and it's a, it's a beautiful, it can be a really beautiful learning experience where you get to see everything about your life in such a deeply... If, if you stay present with it, you can really see its offering, you know, what it what it's teaching you. Now, depending on your belief systems. Again, belief systems have a super important role. Su super important. So if you believe in a judgment day in which you are going to be judged by your peers, this is what tends to happen. You stand there and the most humiliating things that you've ever done are, you know, sort of shown in the sky. Everyone sees it and, you know, they you know, boo you, and then there's people who've even described in their near-death experiences that they, um, and I have studied a lot of the near-death experience because I wanted to see how it lined up with what I was shown about the afterlife in my awakening and how that lines up with um, 
some of the teachings in the you know in the tantric teachings that I received about what to do, how to how to transition um, through death, um, uh, and even well into a auspicious as they say um, reincarnation and even out um, out of samsara. And I found that they very much line up with what is taught. That they're super consistent, you know. Uh, near death experiences don't lie. They happen at different levels, right. and there's different levels of consciousness that people are talking about. It's not exactly true in that, that that's the only option, but that's what they're seeing based on their beliefs. Everyone talks about a life review. Who comes back, you know, consciously to, to talk about it? Mm. I'm really, I'm really curious to ask you about mm -hmm. your personal experience as okay. well. I know you want to okay. talk about many other topics as well. It's such a complex... It's very, 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 very complex. So to put it into... I mean, this is talked about for years in training, you know. So to, to put it in a, you know, one hour is, is really quite crazy. But, you know, I just think it's, it's, it's important for people to think about these things and to think about what might happen after death. And even if it's... You know, there's many ways you can approach it, but it's good to have a conscious idea you know maybe you're just going to let it happen naturally and just figure whatever happens happens and that's going to be your style but at least you've thought about that you right. know or maybe i'm going to be prepare myself that if i'm afraid that i'm going to hold the light with inside myself and i'm going to um stay as true to myself as i can you know or maybe you know what when i die i'm really going to go straight to my god you know and i'm just going to call on my god and my angels and i'm going to ask for all their help and i'm just going to trust they're there for me i mean all of these are are signs that you have taken a conscious responsible uh, proactive approach to passing which is not what a lot of people do most people avoid it you know, and then hope it kind of comes quickly and that you know, they sort of like, eek, you know, turn their heads and, <laughs> and hope that they don't have to um, deal with it. To deal with it, yeah. And like anything in life, imagine doing that with anything in life. It, the way it turns out is, is not as good, yeah, as if we had actually been aware and awake and responsible. Amara, and I have a question. What happens if I believe that there is nothing after death? Right. Um, okay, well, everyone, well, who's lived to come back and talk about it? Um, atheists that have died and come back, you know, every single one of them has said, oops, <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. Um, there's something that's, that's there. And everyone has to deal with the light and everyone has to deal with the dark to some degree. Uh, nobody gets free of that. Um, so... There, it, it's it's very 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 complex. You know the the light. So okay, let's just say that you have you know the the life review experience, and um, and at this point, this is where the offerings begin. There's also you know this is where fear and offerings come in because you begin to negotiate. Yeah. And this is what. So when I have worked now with you know like we said a thousand with over a thousand people 1300 people now i think in the last six years when i began working with them and i started what i did was i started to feel i could see and hear and feel into the lie that was in their system so the lies they would tell themselves like basically the biggest lie is i'm not worthy i'm not good enough right this is the big lie so i would follow this lie and i would track it within their system where did it come from and I would hear, oh, th there's a parent. There's usually a parent or a teacher, you know, an uncle or an auntie or grandparent. But it's, it's usually one of the parents or somewhere in life something showed them, seemed to confirm to them you're not good enough. You know, here, let me show you how to do it. You don't know anything. Let me show you how it goes, you know. And we start to get either these very a big examples of that or these little examples of that that add up to I'm not worthy, right? And then as I would follow it, and I wanted to always know where's the root of it because I knew if I could pull it out at the root, if I could address the root cause of it, yes. um, we could really get somewhere. 
So when I started this whole work, I had no idea that I was going to see into the beyond uh, any more than what happened within my own, you know, personal awakening, which was informing my system. But I went in and I and I tracked this and I saw that there were incarnations, there were other incarnations that were still lingering in people's field. And again, I call this, we can call it a past life incarnation or we can call it archetypal energy. Okay, we don't have to say it's both and neither. <laughs> so let's just put the argument of... Are there are past lives real? Just because this conversation was easy enough. <laughs> yeah, let's just put that <laughs> aside. That's another topic. And, it, and let's just say it doesn't matter. Let's just say that within that person's energy field, they have an archetypal energy um, that says, I'm not good enough. Um, and it goes into, you know, something beyond this lifetime. So I would see, as I would start to follow this, I would actually be able to see back into the moments where they negotiated their next life. And I didn't know people were negotiating their, their next lives, and I, but I, every time, again and again and again, I would see the negotiation that they made. I would see that they're making deals on the other side. Um, if they are, I mean, not. it's just like in life, not everyone gets... Not everyone has the same bargaining power, you know, no. let's just say. <laughs> Some people are really good negotiators. Some people just take whatever they get. Who are we negotiating with? Well, we seem to be negotiating. Um, ultimately, we're negotiating with ourselves. We're in negotiation. Yeah, we're negotiating with... Um, yeah, what's left of the our belief systems and our illusions about reality and how things are. There's nothing to negotiate with. But we think there is. We feel there is. Because we have fear, because we have guilt, because we have shame, because we have regret. And these things cause us to have an experience in which we judge ourselves or we judge others. And then we have this universal feeling that we want to come back and try again. And what I saw is that people who are incarnated, they at least, they had to have a certain percentage of willingness to come back, to want to be here, for the most part. There are some exceptions where you really just get flipped back into a new life. But that usually happens when people die really quickly, really suddenly. It wasn't, maybe they were too young. It was, there's, there are some few exceptions. But let's just stick with the majority of people, okay? They have an experience in which, you know, their time has come, so to speak. And what I saw was that there were these negotiations going on and that people were making, there was contracts with other people in their soul circle. I was seeing soul circles and I was seeing how they were coming through. And the soul circles would come in and they would speak to me and it would show me how all these things were lining up. And there's many, many times where I've seen, seen things on the other side and I've explained who's involved and what's happening and people are just amazed, you know. It's saying, oh my God, that makes so much sense and I can't believe you knew that and you said that and you saw that. So, and I saw this was happening, you know, again and again and again. There may be, there are threads of these, what's called the bardo, sort or of the in-between state between life and death. Um, that's what it's called in the... Buddhist tradition, the, the bardo state. And in this state, there is, I mean, there's just so many possibilities happening. Um, but there is something that compels us to come back and, and do it again. And then I was seeing that there were, um, yeah, there were traps in these negotiate, mm -hmm. negotiating, you know, depending on how much fear you had, depending on how much desire, how much you felt that you needed something in order to have something, you know. So people will say, yeah, you know, I, would, I really want to do better this time. Uh, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, 
I deserve this, you know, I don't deserve that. Uh, I, oh God, I really want this to happen, you know. And so all of these push and pull and desire and aversion still goes on and it creates an energy from your leftover belief system that brings you into another chance, an incarnation. And then your parents are there as um, the embodiments of the leftover um, positive and negative belief system embodied in the masculine and the feminine, typically. You know, that's how it works. So I found that, you know, and if we follow these threads all the way, we're going to end up at the moment where you perceived yourself to separate from source. This is where they all end up. You know, if you want to know where all your problems came from, it's from that moment. (laughs) (laughs) So you can just stop separating yourself from source and, you know, and all of that falls away. Uh, And then, yeah, you're reborn into the wholeness that you always were. Okay? (laughs) So um, what I saw just out of a real compassion for people was like, wow, what if we could make better deals? Um, What if we didn't need to negotiate so much? And what happens if we don't need to come back and do it again, but if we choose? What if we have more choice? Just like in life, it's very empowering to have choice. And then to take the responsibility of that choice. So same on the other side. Yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to know what happens if I choose not to come back. And what happens beyond that? Okay. So they say when... um, Yeah, when you meet the light... um, And there's a a man who I really like his experience. um, And some people might be interested in his experience. That was Melon Benedict Thomas. And he is um, one of the... It's actually the... Yeah, look him up. He's the most documented person in a near-death experience who was actually able to go and see beyond the beyond. Um, And this, you know, we talk about gate, gate, you know, paragate, the great beyond, you know, going beyond the beyond. So what happens? So an egoic being will have a sense of either I want to come back and do it again, I want to do better, I want another chance, this time I want this, or I want to play with that, or I don't want to experience this, you know. Or they'll have a sense I don't want to come back again. These tend to be the two um, camps that we hang out in. (laughs) There are people who is like, I can't wait to be here, and people I can't wait to get out of here, right? (laughs) And we say this a lot to ourselves, like, oh, I'm so not coming back again, you know, I'm, I'm so tired of this. Um, yeah, every, what we call realized being or realized person always says the same thing. Um, there's at least a, a, a part of you that comes back. Once you understand how it, re, how You know, I think it was, who's the famous, um, I'm forgetting now, you know, but the famous guru who said, um, samsara is nirvana. There's nothing to escape. There's nothing to try to get out of. There's nothing to try to not come back to. (laughs) When you actually realize the immense um, beauty and totality you know, of divinity and beyond. Uh, There's nothing, there's no you that would rise up to say, I don't want. And there's also nothing that would rise up and say, I do want. So out of that, there seems to be an understanding when you, when you surrender to the unknown, that, um, and how I was shown this, really hard to put into words, but it's what I call the quantum field, and that um, we're all emanations anyway, um, of higher self or the greater oversoul or, you know, dimensions that then, you know, it's like the ocean and raindrops, you know, we're all raindrops of an ocean, um, 
going back to ocean, rising back up as a cloud, coming back down as raindrops. You know, the cycle goes around and around and around. You know, can you get out of the cycle of ocean? If we're saying ocean is the metaphor for all that is, no, you don't get out of a cycle of ocean. Um, but there is that which is, we could say, beyond ocean. Uh, and you're also that. So some part of you is out. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful way to... <laughs> and some play. part of you is always in. And you're okay with both. You're okay with both. And there are many places that you can hang out um, if you have the choice that are not particularly what we call an earth experience. Um, but everyone who's gone way out into the vast beyond, um, they say that earth is pretty, actually pretty amazing. <laughs> And some of the other places are kind of boring, so <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's true, but um is, yeah. Is there a heaven and hell? <laughs> yeah, I would answer this in the same way that I answer a lot of things, um, that there is and there isn't. You know, the best answer is yes and no. So if there is to you, then there is to you. And energetically, all of our thoughts create, um, they create, let's just say they create a reality. So whether you want to call it an illusory reality or a holographic reality, you know, however you want to put that into words, we do create dimensional realities with our thought process. And so there are heaven-ish and hell-ish dimensions of being that seem to be real, that people seem to experience as real. People meaning, you know, bodies of consciousness that have not merged yet with the mm, totality of what they are. So, you know, consciousness can hang out as itself in a little bubble, you know, that raindrop can have, um, if it doesn't meet the ocean fully, we could say, yeah, maybe it, it, it kind of sidetracks over to what seems to be an eternal heaven experience or it feels like an eternal hell experience. Um, but these are not sustainable, totally sustainable expressions. They're not the full picture. So they don't go on forever. Um, we would call them, you know, a, a heaven is like a God realm. You know, there's different levels of being. And you can get all into the studies of the different levels of being and the different dimensions and, you know, where you might, end up and you know what you believe in is ten it has a lot to do with what you'll be shown and where you will gravitate towards and what choices that you'll have um, and then from that uh, you learn but yes there have been numerous times many 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 times of people corroborating the experience of heaven and hell as, as a, a dimensional experience so, and those are the temptations of, of fear and desire, you know, to desire to live in a heavenly place. Yeah, it's uh, quite, quite possible to live there and be there. I'm sure you can enjoy yourself <laughs> really well there. And at some point, I imagine in that, when that becomes, because um, consciousness is always evolving the, creation, the creations that we make are always evolving. Earth is evolving. Humanity is evolving. Consciousness evolves. Heaven and hell evolves. Um, everything that evolves in consciousness evolves in all layers everywhere. It's not a static thing. So it's evolving. And out of that, there will be an evolution that tends to want to express itself again in some way when redemption comes. True redemption is, we could say, is when you you realize the light of what you are, and you follow that inspiration and the impulse, and experiences have their time. Mm -hmm. You know, when they they just feel complete, something is ready to move on. And Amara, at the beginning of this interview, you start talking about. Um, dying consciously mm. and the importance of cultivating consciousness while we are alive mm -hmm. and that we can also wake up right mm -hmm. when we die mm -hmm. so can you talk about that 
you know the in the inner work or the um, you know yeah awakening of consciousness yeah it really depends a lot on what you want so if you are interested in liberation freedom and you take that as far as your mind can possibly push it out we, we're going to have it's still going to be a limited e- expression in our mind because our mind cannot possibly grasp the totality of liberation but let's just say it tried really hard you know <laughs> so your mind is like okay freedom right so that would mean that when i die i can go anywhere i want to go i can be anything i want to be i can choose anything that i want to choose right this would be a pretty good idea about uh liberation now not everybody wants that some people want to be um happy or safe or um So that's what you want on the conscious side. Oh my gosh. Then there's what's going on in the unconscious, you know. What what you don't want. I don't want to be punished, you know. I don't want to be, you know, and then you're going to attract that as well. Um both of what you want and what you don't want. So as long as there is a you that is perceiving itself as separate from source, separate from totality, is not interested in freedom. you're going to create experiences that are both positive and negative in this life and in any other experience that happens afterwards so you got to be really honest with yourself you know what do i want if you want to be free really 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 free then you have to be willing to um step into what is called the unknown the great mystery that is outside of control it's outside of concepts it's outside of beliefs and ideas if you just want to die and go to heaven that i would suggest that you prepare yourself for that and that you really you know um you know train yourself up on that <laughs> mm-hmm. if you um you see you see that's a different thing than wanting to be free yeah one thing that comes to me is that we don't know that we have the option to be free because we believe that heaven is our best option that's right yeah and so this is something that i'm seeing a lot of um people in the field of conscious evolution mm, it's starting it's starting to come forward it's just starting to come forward this was things that were very secretly talked about from people who woke up to the fact that wait a minute i just woke up out of my belief system So now there's no more limitation to my experience. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, well there's something beyond. And now I'm going to look at what's beyond. Um before these things weren't really talked about. Now we have the internet and we have people wondering and talking about and saying and and we can actually google experiences that people have had. A lot of the near death experiences that people have had, they're they're not had by enlightened people. they're had by egoic frameworks so if you just look at the heaven ex- hell experiences out there that they experience in their near death thing that's the realm that they're dealing with based on their consciousness mm, interesting um what was really interesting about melan thomas's near death experience is that he stayed conscious during his death he died conscious and when the light came to him he asked it to stop and he asked it to answer his questions and he began to have a conscious dialogue with source or with god and most people don't think they have that option they just sort of you know quiver at what is thrown at them and thankful for what they get and you know really try not to be horrified at you know what's being shown to them as as far as yeah the fear that arises you know or grabbing on to whatever good things they can get and that's pretty much it and then from there they're given options to come back again and to do whatever work they're going to do yeah. or live whatever kind of life they get I'm sure they get some bonuses and then they also get some, you know, deficits based on you know there there's a word for the um 
Ah, gosh, some people talk about the lords of karma or like the great Yawa or the great, I think that was as a Yama or Yawa was, is the great beast that come and judges you, you know, on judgment mm. day and decides whether you've been good or bad. And this was a very ancient kind of belief set uh, or a belief that um, still exists but has kind of evolved from that time. And if you look at the near-death experiences in ancient times, they're different than they are now. There's an evolution of beliefs, but... Um, that have evolved out of that, and it, and it keeps evolving. Um, so if you do want to be free beyond just a dualistic um, good place or bad place, <laughs> uh, there is a third way. There is a middle way. Um, there is a neutral path. There is the path of the, mid of the middle uh, and the path of the beyond. And this has to do with a great amount of... Of surrender. Um, you really have to be willing to give it all up for the unknown. It's just like in an awakening in life, in your body, you have to be willing to die for it. So you have to be willing to die for awakening. Like even if it kills me, I'll still wake up. Like this, this is something everyone who's had a spiritual awakening has to face. Even if I go mad, even if I die, um, oh, I'm willing to see what's beyond what I know. Yeah. Well, in death, you're already dying. <laughs> <laughs> you're already dead. Yeah, you're already dead. So <laughs> you can't say, even if I die. So what's left? You know, right. well, even if I end don't up, even if I don't come back, even if I never see my loved ones again, even if I end up some in some dark void somewhere that, you know, whatever your mind can make up, it's going to tell you. It's going to tell you that's what it is. Even if I end up floating around in some dark void for the rest of all eternity, I'm still wanting to know what's beyond my concepts or what it's being offered to me. I'd like to know. I'd like to see. You know, I have a right to, to know what's beyond. And if you stay conscious and you sit with that, you will be shown. Um, it's possible. And... Uh, where I've seen, if we just want to cut to the chase, you know, where it ends up is in a something very much like a black hole in the center of the light or, you know, around the light, the light in the dark or, you know, both there, not there, however you want to see it, but you're going to end up going into a, a deep experience of the unknown. Uh, and what comes out of that, you're, you're not going to get to know. <laughs> so how free do you want to be? Is it worth the risk? Or do you want to just go back to, you know, door prize number one? <laughs> you say like door number one, door number two, or the mystery door. Um, but if you have experienced trust and faith, and if you have, mm, it's good to speak to the light, to speak to God, to speak to truth, certainly before you die. Hmm. Uh -huh. hmm. And definitely when you are dying and after you have died, I would suggest speaking to them throughout the whole process, you know, Brilliant. speak to God, speak to light, speak to source, you know, speak to truth, speak to wisdom in your own heart uh, and in your own way, in your own prayers, in your own meditation, definitely connect to that and find out what's true for you and what do you want. You know, like my father, he just wants to live in heaven with God. I think fishing, you know, and singing, singing Bible hymns or something. And he, he wanted to do that for a long time, and that would make him very happy. And um, depending on how he does with the fear and temptation, I am absolutely sure he'll end up uh, in that place, enjoying that for as long as, however long that's going to last. Um, yeah. Do you? I think this is more or less. Um, we will have to finish this interview. Yeah. And there are so many more questions that I would like to ask you, <laughs> though. And it's just part two. Fascinating part topic. Two topic. Yeah, it's it could go on forever. Amazing. Yeah. The possibilities that this opens to all of us. Yeah. So let's just say or name or discuss a little bit of the main things that we should be aware mm -hmm. in life 
that will affect our experience after death. Okay. And I want to add that I love the that you mentioned freedom and the possibility beyond even what we consider, you know, judgment or mm -hmm. even heaven. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so um, judgment is the fastest way to close the heart. The way we judge others in this lifetime and the way we judge ourselves has probably one of the biggest impacts on the other side. So one of my personal, if we could call it, missions in life is to move us beyond judgment into discernment. So these are languages that, you know, and I'm going to tell you how I'm using that word. So judgment is when we, you know, we really view something or someone that they've done and it really comes out in this, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, you know, um, you're bad, I'm good, or I'm bad, you, you're right, you were, you were right, I am wrong. And I'm not saying that we don't have right and wrong in a relative experience in life, because we absolutely do. But there's something far beyond that. Um, and when we start to hit on discernment, when we don't need to put somebody else down in order to be okay, we don't need to put ourselves down in order to be okay, when... You know, when we don't have to fall into the negative emotions of fear, guilt, shame. Um, we don't need to employ blame. There's a lot of blame that comes with judgment. And judgment is a real lack of taking responsibility. It's actually a really nifty way to not have to be responsible. It's just to put forth judgment. Yeah. And when we move into discernment... Uh, we're able to still maintain the field of love and compassion and still make um, a discerning call as to what is, we could say, right or wrong for us. You know, but, but we don't need to, nobody has to be, um, yeah, judged in order for that to happen. So the heart doesn't close. You know, we don't need to um, defend ourselves in order to make the call. We can still stay open, realize that something needs to change, and just um, act accordingly. This is a higher level of a refined, more loving expression of judgment and discernment. So one of the ways that we, yeah, that we really suffer on the other side is in the experience of judgment in our whole life being judged. And, and you know, some will tell you God is judging you. Some will tell you, you know, the devil's judging you. And, and many will tell you it's just you judging you. And we're actually the hardest on ourselves. So however you experience that, some will say others are judging you, your community is judging you. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a sense of judgment mm -hmm. that we could say is quite universal that happens when we pass. And it's because it's happening here. Wow. That's a big one. Yeah. So when we stop judging and we start discerning and we're more interested in, um, yeah, when we move out of the field of right and wrong mm -hmm. and we start weaning ourselves off of right and wrong and instead we look in a more discerning way at um, what is loving and what is more loving, you know, or what is loving and even more consciously loving. You know, there's nothing but love. So how can we take this love and really, like, you know, get into it in a, in a deeper way? That's how I would look at uh, discernment. And that's going to involve, you know, moving towards some things and away from other things and um, stepping up to some things and letting other things fall away. But we don't need to close our hearts for that. <laughs> so if we were not judging on this side, if we were not judging on the other side, there would be a lot more freedom about where we could go and what we could do and what we could experience. Um, which is very scary to us. We, uh, freedom is actually really terrifying to most human psyche, although that's starting to change. Mm. Um, 
because we think, oh, well, if we're all just completely free, that means that there's going to be chaos and, you know, and all the evil beings are just going to run wild throughout the universe and, <laughs> you know, and it's just all going to go to, you know, hell in a handbasket, as they say. So uh, it's actually not that way. It's actually the opposite. When we start to discern and we look from love at our experience of truth, um, things become less dangerous, more safe, you know, less suffering, more beauty, more peace, more bliss, more joy, uh, less sacrifice, less suffering. It's actually the opposite. Um, it's the right and the wrong and the judgment that is causing all of the this push-pull and these bipolarized expressions, these good-bad, you know, mm, dualistic qualities to exist in our experience. <laughs> does that make sense? It does. Um, so less judgment of yourself and others, uh, more connection to your birthright to be free, more willingness to express your freedom, um, more responsibility when you get the feedback of that expression and you realize, oh, maybe my freedom, I used it in a way that was hurtful to myself or others and I need to look at that again. I need to make an adjustment. I need to turn that around. Uh, and a willingness to learn in a really responsible way and be free and not be afraid, you know, of who and what you are. Mm. <laughs> that sounds like a big task, yeah. and a, but a beautiful one. Yeah. And something that we can all do while we are alive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we do have an, you know, we do want to feel like we have a purpose. We do want to feel like we're here for a reason. You know, for some people it's a really esoteric reason. And for some people it's a really specific reason. You know, like I'm here to be a mother. There's a very specific experience of meaning. For others, I'm here to... Um, you know, be kind or something. Or I'm here to um, experience a source or spirit in manifested form. You know, that that's like a very loose expression of, you know, a meaning of life. I'm here to be a doctor. You know, it's a, <laughs> people have these, you know, different variances on their, their purpose. But getting in touch with your purpose is... Um, it's, it seems to be very important... If you want to be free, having met your purpose, experienced it, mastered it to some degree, softened and then surrendered and let go seems to be a lot easier once wow. you've done that. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't master something, even if it's just our own mind, our own thoughts, which is a big one, our, our own breath, our own outlook on life, if we don't master that, we tend to not really mm, feel like we're ready to be free yeah Amara <laughs> always amazing <sighs> okay thank you and I just invite mm -hmm. everyone to send questions if they want and I know they can find you on amarasamata.com mm -hmm. and also your work the Inner Guidance Institute yes yeah w welcome to if there's anyone yeah, who's interested in connecting with me and they have questions about um, conscious dying, um, conscious living, conscious parenting, uh, conscious birthing. All of that is, you know, it's all equally important. And, uh, and also just know that trust is your, is your greatest saving grace. Um, you know, grace is always there for you, waiting for you. And... Um, that which you truly are, uh, you, you cannot escape it, <laughs> uh, you cannot lose it, um, you cannot be ever separated from it. So mm -hmm. wherever you find yourself in life, um, or as you're transitioning, or even if you have a loved one that's transitioning, you know, always go back to, in every moment to, you know, what is it that you trust the most, and what would you like to trust if it were okay? And, and really start to evolve your experience of trust or faith um, and grow that into something that's really going to serve you uh, um, 
yeah, in your life and in your purpose. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Amara. Thank you so much. That was fun. <laughs>